I can't say how long I have been waiting for this conversation. Truly, I just need to say that again. It's been a long haul, a long time waiting to talk with men about men and to hear what you have to say. So I am here today really as truthfully as, as a listener, as somebody who wants to learn from you about what we need to know more about, right? as much as I want to share what I've learned um, about um, disasters, and particularly about gender, and most particularly about women and girls. But first, let me backtrack a little bit and say thank you. I think we lost um, Jim, but that was a fabulous welcome to country. And I only wish we did that in the United States. We do not, and it's our shame that we don't. It's our loss. So he's grounded our conversation in a place and you bring with you particular experiences that will, will help you engage in conversation with us. I'm tasked, tasking myself really with trying to broaden our discussion a bit because a lot of my work has been in the United States, quite a bit has been international as well. Let me tell you just a, a little bit about that. I'm um, an accidental <laughs> disaster sociologist. I had a quite normal life before we moved to Miami in 1992, two months before Hurricane Andrew came. My loving husband, a geologist, was in Kalgoorlie looking for gold. He was like gone, absent, missing in action when the hurricane came. So we went through this with myself and my two small boys. So while most of my research has been about women in disaster, my family, it was all about my boys, my sons, my father, my husband. So it's been near and dear to my heart, but I have not been able to move into men and masculinities and disasters as a researcher yet. So again, this is really a path-breaking conference. It's an opportunity to learn from one another, figure out what we need to do next. Thank yous. Thank you again for the, whoever it is who footed that bill for that enormously expensive trip over here. It's, it really costs a lot of money, and I do appreciate it. Thank you for the organizers for being there and for the work that you did as researchers, which again is just I keep saying this to you, but path-breaking. I've been telling everybody in the United States that I'm coming to have this conversation with you about masculinities. It's so um, long overdue. Thank you for all of you who left everything that you should be doing today behind, all that work, all the dishes perhaps, the family issues, the community work that you need to be doing, everything you left behind to be here today. And I know it's a big ask. Many of you drove a long way as well. And thank you for coming with open hearts and being able to, to be in touch again with what you've seen and what you've been through. Um, to share that to the degree that you would like to, that's also something very precious that you bring. I'll be talking a lot um, from photographs, so I'd like to also just um, <laughs> put out there that I, I am, am kind of breaking the law here. I don't attribute particular photographs to their photographers. I apologize for that to them in abstentia. Come visit me in jail if somebody ever calls me on this. But I use photographs to tell a story about disaster. Um, but I do thank the photographers, and I particularly thank the subjects who let me speak about them through their images, and of course without their permission. So just know that when I'm um, using my clicker, which is surely here someplace, um, Thank you. Thank you. That um, they didn't invite me to use their images, but I'm, I'm cheerfully doing so as well. So with that, let me say, first of all, um, I have been told more than once I speak a little bit too quickly, so if I do, please, Trisha, I'm looking at you, <laughs> let me know, please. We have about an hour, and this is what I'd like to um, talk with you about, basically, these general themes. We can stop and talk a little bit more, perhaps at the end of the day, have some conversation about some of these in particular. But the title of the talk is The Gendered Terrain of Disaster Through Men's Eyes, which comes from um, the first collection of work that we did with my colleagues Betty Herm uh, Morrow in the United States, bringing together an international collection of writing about disasters through women's eyes knowing at the time that we were telling a partial story but not having the capacity, not having the knowledge or the research yet to tell a fuller story. So why do we need a gender lens? We, we won't um, have much time to talk about that, but I thought I would just make a few essential points about that. And the, the most essential one is that gender is always part of our lives. It's part of who we are. It's part of the symbolic kind of artistic world that we move in, the ideological world. It structures our organizations and institutions. It helps us understand who is where in a particular moment when the winds come, when the fire comes, who's doing what and how and where, how we feel about it, how our bodies might respond differently, the different kind of cultural norms and understandings we have. So it's really important to say at the outset that while gender may not always be the most important thing that we need to understand when we talk about risk communication or emergency management relief systems or long-term recovery or mitigation or preparedness, it's never, ever irrelevant. 
because it's always part of us and who we are. It's good to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> So I think that there are enormous gaps, again, as a sociologist, I've, I've um, done a number of studies and, and now I'm trying to move forward and working as a professor with the next generation of emergency management students. And this is what I try and impress upon them, that gender is not an add-on, something that overburdened people who are already doing too much during the day need to suddenly take on board and become gender experts. No. It's that if we're talking about resilience, we have to understand that from a gender perspective, what does it mean for men's relationships with other men and women's relationships with other women and men and women, right? If we're looking at long-term recovery, what are some of the sort of gender issues and themes that were so clearly laid out? And Graham, thank you again for that, for, for laying out the landscape for us and sketching out the, the major themes. So if even we're looking at good practice, what does that mean? What is it, what is it that makes a, a practice good and healthy and helpful and sustainable? Well, there are some gender concerns there as well. Bottom line, I would challenge us to, to think of anything in this work of anticipating and preparing and coping, surviving, and responding and recovering from disaster that does not come back to sex and sexualities and gender and gender relationships. So, it's kind of an article of faith. I would just leave that there. But having said that, it's also important to understand that there's not one single gender lens. And if only we study hard enough or get that PhD, we, we capture it. Of course not. Gender is just like any other kind of social power dynamic that shifts. The moment you shift your angle of vision just a tad to, say, 50 years ago in this part of the country, right? Or to 2,000 years from now, or to another era, to another culture, to another generation. As soon as we shift just a bit, we see uh, sometimes a radically different picture of what gender means in crises and in situations. So it's important for us to understand that, again, it's not something that one gets and checks off the list, but there's a sensitivity and awareness to the depth and complexities of gender, when we're talking about women and men and, and boys and girls. So there's no one single lens, and then I do love the, the metaphor of the kaleidoscope because I think we need to be always turning that lens, if you will, the kaleidoscope to see what's new, and there will always be something new. Well, let me make a few uh, preliminary points about, about men, and um, bear with me, I'm a sociologist, we generalize, we do this for a living, so <laughs> when you think to yourself, well, that's not true for me, then hold that thought and let's talk about it um, some more, but we are speaking in generalities here as social scientists, or I, I am. Well, who speaks for men? I'm sad, sad to say that really nobody speaks for men, and again, that's why I'm so excited to be here, right? We know the popular culture. I mean, somebody made that film, The Titanic, and it has all kinds of messages that men are um, presumably taking on board and articulating in their own lives. The, the notion that, that even the middle class professional kind of um, model of hegemonic masculinity in our particular era is also a hero. He has that cape on. That's, a, that's an articulation of a particular ideal, not necessarily generated by, um, by actual men in the, in the universe. And of course, our, our humor and, and that notion that men should always be self-sacrificial, that women and children, by definition, come before the value of any male life. Who's articulating that? idea, yeah, and where did that come from? The bottom picture is an Australian picture, and it's the one that comes home to me as a researcher most, because virtually all that I've learned about men and masculinities and disasters, aside from what happened in my family, I learned from women. So we have a very partial sight. We have a derivative sense of what um, men's lives are like in disaster, because other people are speaking on your behalf. They're telling us about how you felt or what they tried to help you with, or what they thought you were going through, or what they think that you're needing. So she here may be speaking for him because he is silenced, or because he's silencing himself, can't get it out, right? Can't, could be. Or she may be speaking for him because the researcher is letting the person who speaks most freely um, and, and is more accustomed to that kind of dialogue that you have with somebody with a tape recorder. In any event, he is silenced in that sense, and that's a shame. So we have to understand some of the reasons for that. Um, it's partially, and again, that's why I'm so appreciative of your presence here today, that men are silencing themselves, I think not wanting to, not caring to, not um, considering that there's some, something of value in the, in the dialogue around gender. That's been the case in, in the um, kind of the history of feminist studies until relatively recently that men and masculinity studies have um, come to the fore, so we're beginning to move beyond that. But that certainly has been true in the past. From a practitioner perspective, um, there's the notion that gender kind of falls off the radar screen in men in particular because people in our culture, in our time, stand in for men. The generic male is the same thing as the generic um, victim, if you will, or the survivor, the responder. is kind of implicitly always men. So you talk sometimes with people and say, well, I'm always talking about men. 
But they're not. They're not articulating that notion of masculinity. They're just confounding people with men. Uh, another reason that follows from that is basically when we do talk about gender, we so, so often assume that that means women, and you know that very well, so I won't belabor that point. It doesn't mean women, of course, but that's how it's interpreted. And when we talk about women, sometimes what we really mean is families or children. There's a lot to be said about that confounding, again, of women and children. There's also a notion, I think, in, at the scholarly level of benign neglect, and I would say it's not particularly benign, but it's certainly neglectful, and it comes both from disaster researchers and from gender scholars, and it comes from our institutionalized response system, disaster management. And that is a cultural universal. I put it out there. Would love to be proven wrong, but this is the, the, the lay of the land so far. It's a highly masculinized um, culture, and statistically and culturally and sociologically, politically. And I think there's also something you said about why we have such silence around men and masculinities and disasters that comes to power and resistance to not wanting to know, not wanting to ask, not wanting to say, not wanting to show. And I hope maybe this afternoon we could come back to that a little bit and talk a little bit more about that. Well, I've, I've identified um, a number of challenges that I'd like to put forward today. And before I launch into those, they're, they're kind of Elaine's idea of 12 or, or 10 kind of streams of knowledge and, if you will, a, a kind of an action research agenda. In other words, questions that we need to know more about. But I, I'm conscious as I, as I do that, and I was putting together this talk, of one of the best critiques of the gender and disaster subfield um, that, that I read. And this person was critical of our work and was making the point that we are at risk of replacing one stereotype with another. So I often write, particularly maybe five or ten years ago, more than now, of weeping women rescued by strong-armed men in disaster, right? Because it's such a positive, such a strong norm. You see it in popular culture all the time. I see it in movies. It's just, it's just everywhere. She's crying all the time. He's rescuing her, right? He's strong. She's weak. So in our work, there has been an emphasis, perhaps understandable, but I think not good. There's been an emphasis on reversing that. So let's study the capacities of women, the resilience of women, the leadership of women, the cultural knowledge that women and girls bring. But the same token, the flip side of that, is that we have been looking more at the weaknesses, if you will, the vulnerabilities of men in a way to kind of balance these stereotypes. And I think it's a loss. I think that's. Um, something that we should not do, basically, what we have to do is understand the complexities of women and men and boys and girls and everybody in between, all of us who share both vulnerabilities and strengths pretty much all the time and particularly acutely during crises. So getting away from this readjusting one stereotype by replacing another one, the strengths of women and the weaknesses of men. I make that point because a lot of the research and my themes that I'll be drawing out today focus on vulnerabilities, the challenges, the things that really make it difficult. And that's not only because I care about that, but because that's what we know most about so far. So there's a lot of work to yet, yet to be done. So before we launch into that, it's, it's imperative to kind of sketch a little bit um, of, of the sense of the lay land around masculinity and power, because that's the flip side of this. There's a larger context to a discussion about the vulnerabilities of men. And that is the power that accrues to men. Again, I, this is a, um, a long and um, familiar argument to you, that men bring to the situation by virtue of growing up boys in our culture. So it's not something necessarily that um, men seek or that men willingly pursue. And some do, of course, and some don't. But it benefits all men differently in different ways in, some, in different circumstances. So it's the, it's the lay of the land. We have to start there. And this picture comes from Bangladesh, makes the point very vividly to me, because these are twin children. And you can see which one is the girl and which one is the boy. And we understand just from this graphic image who's more likely to survive in a disaster and who's not. And we don't need the World Health Association to tell us about the, the lower caloric intake of girls around the world to see what this picture means. So there's that. There's that literal sur cultural survival. Um, there's the global economy that has been constructed largely by male-driven international financial organizations and a, and a massive um, kind of uh, international, not massive, it's an international global economic system that benefits and privileges elites who are predominantly men, right? In this picture, men in Mexico. We used to always say white men. Well, that's, that's not true, but male elites. And puts women on the streets at their feet. 
Again, this is a system. It's not a question of blaming or, or whatever. It's a question of what are we doing about it? What are we going to do about it? But there is that sense of privilege that accrues to men. Men also have, as you know, um, a, a much stronger leadership role, if not domination, in most of the scientific and technical fields, which come strongly into play in disaster risk management, as they do in, um, a, a, in, in the acclimation that accrues to men and women, but to a like, greater degree here, men, who are in response and rescue roles. So if you look at who wears the uniform, who the photographer is going to focus on. In this case, these are two men who are receiving, I'm sure, a well-deserved reward for rescuing some people from a burning building. And I just put it to us that there are women who also rescue in different ways and do life-saving activities every day and will never be behind the photographer's screen and will not be framed in that way. So that's the power. Again, that's a privilege that accrues to men. And then there's an ideological power. There's a misogyny that's free-floating, right? I mean, these are little, just little pictures from Katrina. I uh, won't belabor that one down there, but there's a, there's a sense of entitlement that uh, men can and do um, articulate that, that free-floating, um, really, hatred and mis misogyny, I, th I think, uh, of women that it surfaces at moments of crisis as a joke, as a, as a humor. There's a lot to be said about gender and disaster and humor. And speaking of humor, I mean, I really don't get this, but people are selling this. Maybe you have ordered yours already, um, underwear for your small children or for your grandchildren who would like to grow up and become real men, i.e. become an emergency manager. But the one on the left is, of course, in pink with, with incipient breasts. So I don't get it, but there's some kind of mixed message there. Uh, and this picture just, uh, again, stands in for, for the generally received male power to be the voice of disaster, to bring the news to us. So that framing that men traditionally have done through the media is, is another way that men have power in disasters, do run the operational day-to-day um, -day operations of disasters around the world, do make the political decisions. This is Governor Christie in New Jersey and, and the widely noted handshake between him and our, our current President Obama, right? making critical decisions about whether there will be federal monies coming into the state, whether the governor will even accept them. So those are decisions made at the higher echelons of our political system, which pretty much around the world are dominated by men in a particular class and racial uh, composition. There's also, uh, I put this picture here to remind us that there's a physicality as well to power, to gender power. Uh, and here is just one among many pictures that you can find where when push comes to shove, and it does in disasters, and somebody gets the food and somebody doesn't, um, physical prowess and power um, um, comes into play, as it does here. This is just a, a very uh, hard picture to see, but basically there is a demonstration against uh, what women were, um, were um, articulating was the sexual violence against women in Katrina. Right? And so I put a little flyer down here at the end to show you that women were also organizing around that. But those are some of the things that come up that are, is kind of a larger frame that we need to keep in mind. We talk about the vulnerabilities of men and boys, the challenges that they face. Ah, my last slide also, um, man-made disasters. We, we avoided this language for quite a long time, um, and I think I'd like to reclaim it in a way because there's a certain sense in which disasters are made by men. Hmm? When we look at disaster risk reduction and ask ourselves what has to change and who has made the most critical changes, critical decisions about where we develop, where our population resides, what kind of money and resources will be put into different systems, how strong our houses are, whether our schools have safe rooms, whether we devote the resources necessary to meet the challenges of a changing dynamic climate or not, these decisions, by and large, are made by the political and economic elites of every country, and those people are generally men. So it's a provocative statement, but I say I'd like to reclaim that notion that these are male, men-made disasters, and again, challenge us all to work together to end, to end that. Um, I hope I've already sparked some things that you disagree about. Um, we can come back to that at the end of the day. But let me move on a little bit to articulate uh, 10 challenges. And the first is a problem for me. It, it's one of the main things that comes up in disaster sociology is how many people lost their lives and were they women or were they men? And to me, this is at once one of the most important questions because until we know who's most at risk of the loss of life, we don't know who it is we have to reach or how to reach them. At the same time, there's an implicit kind of an invidious distinction. Ah, it's mainly women, therefore, mm, ah, it's mainly men, therefore. When in fact, of course, we would all agree in this room that every human life is precious, so at least we can agree on that and maybe spend a little bit less time documenting whether they are male or female deaths. But there's a very practical point um, to that, as I've just said, we have to understand it. 
Um, culturally, however, the norm, the understanding is that women and children die uh, in much higher proportion in natural disasters, and I'm going to talk mainly about environmentally inspired disasters today than men. And that's actually not true. It, it's, it's an empirical observation from some countries, and one of the major studies that, that um, made this point in a very strong way was from the, uh, a study, an international study, that compared countries that were very rich and countries that were very poor, and then overlaid on that an analysis of gender relations. So in poor countries that had very strikingly unequal power relationships between women and men, very high levels of female fatality. That study has been uh, picked up by the media and is, and is kind of taken as gospel that men will always, that women will always die in larger numbers than men, and it's not, it's not true. Again, we need to look at what con under what conditions people lose their lives and try and understand that. But the gender component is important because we need to figure out how it is to reach the people who are most at risk. So I don't need to tell you, you will have different images of your own in your mind when I show you this picture of the hotshot fire team that lost their lives in Arizona not long ago. And there was something about the fact that these young men who devoted their entire life to being a hotshot firefighter right, uh, were working to defend their own community. They're trying to piece together what happened. Why did everybody, one survivor in this whole trail, why did everybody die that day? And one of the factors that's been brought forward is, again, because it was hometown. It was turf. It was their home turf. And that led them, perhaps, to linger longer than they could have or might have otherwise. And then the winds shifted, and you know the story. Uh, men do die statistically more often in floods than women. So we might ask um, if insurance companies have known for some time about the risk-taking behaviors of men, right, in little red cars like my two boys, who would cheerfully go through uh, a river unless it's like up to the hood, because why not? <laughs> like my car can make it. And it, it, there's a tragic end to those um, funny stories. We need to really take that on board in terms of fatalities. Men often, as do women, but men in particular, um, will stay home to defend assets. Women lose their lives more often when they're staying home to defend the children, to, to try and um, retain what they can of the household and to try and get those children to safety. But men are more likely, and this is just internationally as a, as a generalization again, to stay home and not evacuate as quickly or to put their own lives on the line in order to defend the livelihood assets and resources that are essential for that family. But men also, as women do, um, do absolutely sacrifice themselves, as you well know, um, to rescue and do whatever they can to help the, the children and the people around them who are most vulnerable. And that's another reason why men who predominate in formal response roles as well as informal response roles um, lose their lives so tragically. But there are other reasons that have to do with the general construction of gender. So why is it that we have such high rates of homelessness among men, higher than among men than among women, although there's some differences in terms of how that plays out. But if you look at who's on the streets in, for example, Boulder, Colorado, where we had a thousand year flood, it's my hometown, just flew through in there. And one of the concerns is that we'll never know how many people lost their lives because all of the homeless people who were never counted anyway and who would not necessarily have been able to get out of harm's way, and those are predominantly men. So we will never know. So homelessness is a major vulnerability in disasters. It's a male-dominated uh, social category. As is extreme heat, a very interesting um, case in point here. There's a fabulous book you may have seen called uh, Heat Wave, A Social Autopsy of, of the Chicago Heat Wave by Eric Kleinenberg. And he went into Chicago in 1995 and tried to understand there was a very large number of people whose bodies were never claimed by anybody who died in, in this horrific heat wave. Predominantly African American, poor, old, and male. Tried to understand why that happened in that community, right? And it's a striking contrast to the research that you may remember on the, the conclusions after the European heat wave, which were dominated by fatalities among women. So what is it? And the answer is basically we don't know and we had better find out. It's a really critical research question to understand under what conditions will more men likely to die in heat waves than women. In the United States, more men die in heat waves. I haven't done the research here. Maybe you can tell me at break whether it's um, similar or, or different here. But given what we know about the climate in the future, heat waves are uh, more and more pressing issues. So again, trying to understand how to reach people with messages that are meaningful and can be acted upon is imperative. One of the things that he found is that men were fearful of gender violence at the hands of younger men in their community. So they closed their windows, 
and didn't let even whatever breezes there might have been there come in. That was one factor. He also writes about the gender of isolation because old and poor men do not remarry, are so estranged from their families and their kin. There was nobody there to know them the day before the heat wave and there was nobody there to claim their bodies the day after the heat wave. They did not ask for help. They knew nobody to ask for help and perhaps as a matter of pride they wouldn't have. That's another, it's just a question. So that's another um, factor as is suicide. Um, and again, I know you have your own images here as well. I just um, devote this slide to the first documented suicide in, in my country after the BP oil spill. And he was a person who made his living in fishing and surprise, surprise, when that oil um, took his livelihood away, he, he took his life. It's something we see way too often. So there's survival. I think another challenge that follows from this, and these 10 ideas are, are very closely woven. I was thinking this morning, it's kind of like the, the lattice on the apple pie, right? That just that you have to understand the intricacies and you can't tease them apart because then you lose the beautiful lattice of the pie. But they're all closely interwoven. So death, of course, has a lot to do with safety. You see that men are at risk uh, in a lot of the informal um, rescue activities that men do. They're at risk because of the damage and cleanup and repair work as well. Um, there's nothing safe about being out there with rudimentary tools and sharp metal edges, and somebody has to do it. And most of the time, the people who are doing it are survivors. They are on the scene doing what needs to be done so that they can get their lives um, headed, headed back in the right direction again. Not a lot of care and attention goes into safety. Um, similarly here, uh, this is again uh, another picture and another cause that happened after Hurricane Mitch in Nicaragua, for example, of high male fatalities because of men who are not accustomed to using heavy machinery, who don't know what they're doing, and yet, you know, for the best of intentions, get out there and pick up the chainsaw, which always reminds me of the story in Miami when we had lost our house and my husband's uh, colleagues came down with their chainsaws in hands and with not one but two, but probably, you know, ten cases of beer. I thought it was just really fun. They were sitting out back with the beer and the chainsaws, and I was a nervous wreck, you know, because we didn't have any house, we didn't have any food, we didn't have any place to stay, that was part of it, but that was what they were doing, their way of helping, and I was worried about their, their safety. It is, a, it is a concern, it is a factor. As is, again, the kind of um, pick up the recovery, the physical recovery work that goes on in the community. These uh, men are not um, provided the kind of um, help that we might wish for them, hard hats, training, heavy equipment. No, people get out and do what they have to do. Again, very often men. And when they do have uniforms and, um, and hard hats and some training, there's another kind of harm that comes from safety, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that as well. How many men have that hug, that response, that male on male, shoulder, body on body kind of support when they're doing really rugged work and wondering who's underneath that pancake concrete? Who's there for them to touch them? Um, this is a picture from Sri Lanka of a uh, transgendered community. The, uh, um, I was going to get that right. Um, it's not Aravasi. Aravini, Aravani, sorry, Aravani. People there whose role is just now beginning to be explored, but the sexual minorities in general, and particularly highly stigmatized and marginalized communities, such as a transgendering community, right, are at extreme risk in disasters. So this is a picture you would uh, consider in a show about men as well as about women. But it's interesting, so we're doing a little bit more research around what they were able to bring to, in a positive way, bring to um, recovery after the cyclone there because of their relatively um, progressive politics. But that's, uh, again, an empirical question. But men who do not conform sexually, in this case, are obviously at risk of danger. Men who, uh, and these are boys, basically, who, who t take up risk-taking activities. And how many times have you seen in your newspaper, the storm is coming, and here's the weather person, the weather man, right, with his camera showing you how close he is to the, to the water, how, how close he can get to death, so we can watch it on the screen. It's madness, but it's what little boys do when they run out and go surfing when the surf's up, right? And they don't always make it back. And this picture speaks to me about um, trafficking, because again, in our conversations about trafficking after disaster, it almost always goes immediately to sex trafficking of girls. Sometimes there's sex trafficking of boys is on our radar screen, and I don't diminish for a moment the reality of that. But it's also true that the trafficking of children is about the tra sex trafficking of boys and about slave labor, child labor, right? Cheap, cheap labor. So universally, that's another one of the risks and harms that boys face more than girls, being taken from their communities, being ripped off, being their labor being exploited, forced to leave uh, to be cheap labor. This is a picture from Haiti, and who knows what the fate of the, of the children were there. So health, again, these are all so closely interwoven, but men, because of a lot of the response roles that they have, are exposed in a way that men in these, uh, women in these roles, or that women, because they're not in these roles, are not to toxics, for example, in complex emergencies, and 
I won't linger on this picture from the tsunami because I think you have pictures of horror in your own mind, but that seeing what you have had to see takes a huge toll. Uh, and sometimes, picture from Australia, the, the grief is uh, too much, too much to be born. Too much for children as well. And we don't, again, we, in our analysis of, of gender, we have spent so little time talking about children. And when we do, we talk about children as a degendered group. Children, animals, pets. <laughs> All of them actually have a sex and a sexuality, but I'm, I'm concerned that we're beginning to look a little bit more closely at children in disaster, but without looking at some of those differences and, and similarities, but the differences between what boys and girls bring to a situation when they're six, which is different than when they're 16, right? We know the difference between our six-year-old sons and our 16-year-olds. So there's a, a health uh, issue for him as well. And then, of course, the familiar picture of men who are unable, and you just don't have to be a researcher for very long to hear this, again, from women unable to bring themselves to ask for help. Not necessarily not knowing where the help is there, not necessarily not knowing that they don't need it, knowing that they need it, knowing that it's available, not able to just go there. Um, and, and a picture about um, lack of nutrition, cultural food may be less available as it was in Labrador due to climate change there. She's no longer able to provide the traditional foods that he needed and so he refuses to eat it uh, and is losing weight. This is a study that was done uh, with support of Health Canada and perhaps going back to more processed, highly processed, unhealthy foods because of that. And a picture from Russia about the substance abuse that we know so often accompanies um, men's and women's, but particularly men's responses to disaster. It takes a huge toll, short term, long term, and in all the ways that you can imagine. So shelter, let me move a little faster because I think I'm um, lingering too much, but shelter is obviously a critical issue. And this person is tasked not only with trying to figure out how to begin to create a safe space for his young son, but also knows that the young son is watching him all of the time. How is dad going to be? going to be um, getting shelter again. I think one of the challenges uh, for, that men face more than women, and of course it depends on which culture and where exactly you're looking, but for the moment let's assume that men are the primary rebuilders of the homes physically, right? To um, negotiate with external aid agents who come in with the best of intentions and want to build houses their way, right? So when we say the community resists, the community fights back, well, yes, yes, but when it comes to people who are actually in those negotiations with aid agencies or with the banks or with the loans, very often it's men because they have that sense of being sh providers and that also includes a shelter, a safe space for families. So if they want to um, build back in a way that respects cultural traditions, they sometimes have to do battle to get it. They often, this is a picture from my country, often just don't have the beginning of the resources. So take on the responsibility, absolutely want to be there, and understand that they need to have a, a place for their family, don't have any money in order to do it. May have relatively shallow uh, friendship networks. I say this tentatively, because again, we don't know about men's networks of support in disasters. We don't know much about that, right? But what we do know in general is that men and women have different kinds of social networks and that women's tend to be more dense, more complex, more connections on the spider web, if you will. So when you have widows, and again, uh, we have uh, widowers, um, we've, we've learned a little bit more about what happens to women in disasters when they are widowed, but not an awful lot at all, really, about what happens to men who lose their life partners in, in disasters there without necessarily that support system. Or men who move into sheltering and caregiving roles in extremely challenging situations, whether they're here in a shelter or whether they're displaced and separated from their families altogether, right? So physically in a different place, but having to somehow try and make sure that their families are, are taken care of. And grandfathers who are also, uh, again, challenged to step up and provide for little ones, provide a shelter, try and find safe space, try and find an alternate um, uh, support system, a caregiving system that they may or may not have ever wanted to or been able to or been tasked to or been um, able to step in and now suddenly, uh, due to circumstances, forced to step in there. So work, of course, and another word for work is livelihood. I use work here to, of course, include paid and unpaid work, but the first challenge for so many men, as you know very well, is get that paycheck, get back to work. Everything that you need to get to move life forward comes down to money, comes down to resources, gotta get back to work. Really, we see that in every disaster, and that's one of the reasons why women's return, their women's economic recovery is slowed. We don't get back to the labor force for the reasons that you know, childcare and other demands like, um, 
but, but it's enormous um, difficulty for him as well. Its work is um, not always available. This little picture um, reminds me about what happens so often when external labor comes. We'll be hearing a little bit more this afternoon, I think, about that. External laborers come in and take those jobs away that locals might have been able to do. When you're looking at construction work, which is one of the major sources of income to people, and mainly, again, accrues to men after disastrous construction work, those monies don't always go to local men. It creates enormous uh, animosities and also a lot less money on the home front where it's, where it's acutely needed. Exploitation is, um, of, of male labor is really a huge, and I, th I think we need to do a lot more work here as well. It's a picture from Katrina, and we had a, a large influx of workers coming from, from the South, coming from Central America and coming from Mexico to fill some of the jobs that needed to be done when there was so little shelter available, so a population evacuated. So these were people living in very difficult circumstances in tents along lakes, right? And wage theft was real, working, 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 never getting paid, right? So the exploitation of migrant workers, documented or undocumented, is an important thing. Um, men's bodies, we're talking still about um, work here. Uh, are exposed in ways that women's aren't because we don't value men's reproductive health. It's always been a mystery to me when you think about making babies, but we do not value men's reproductive health in the same way that we value women's, right? So this is a picture of obviously from Japan after the, the uh, tsunami and the nuclear meltdown there. Interestingly, there will be a conference in, in July and one of the people presenting at our gender and disaster session is a young man who's done research on just this, trying to understand how it is that uh, men's lives are being devalued and employers are specifically recruiting men into these very hazardous um, cleanup jobs around radiation exposure, right? As if, again, the reproductive health of men matters less than, than women's. Um, men whose livelihoods depend on the land, the land, the land, and in an era where um, drought is becoming increasingly normal, and if not drought, then a massive flood next year. In any event, that land, that essential thing that grounds him traditionally for generations, is at risk um, in, in so many different kinds of disasters. This little picture comes from Canada where we did a study of BSC, of mad cow disease, and I met with, with farmers um, there whose main concern was that they would lose the family farm, the century farm, the farmers that their farm, that their forefathers, right? Um, built up from scratch, they would lose them on their shift because really of circumstances beyond their control. They were uh, at extreme risk of losing those, those long-held families. And another thing that comes up when you look at men and challenges to men is around work and the forced economic migration of men and boys. So I mentioned trafficking earlier. It's a fine line between being forced as a child and being forced through economic coercion really um, and being displaced through environmental forces from your own community. But very often, the people that you see dying after the disaster are men who have been uh, forced to go into, uh, due, to, due to drought, for example, in South Africa, go forced into the gold mining industry. Very, very hazardous. HIV, AIDS, high uh, rates, uh, suicides, high malnutrition. Everything that's difficult and hard about life gets worse when you're on your own and you're, you're in, a, in a migrant um, uh, hostel, far, far, far from your home. So family um, issues, again, we are beginning to get a better sense of what single mothers um, need in disasters, but this young man is a single father, especially a low-income single father. Nope, we don't know much at all of what he needs or what he brings um, to a disaster as a parent. Um, this, this is kind of the norm. We had the family norm. There's the, the mother, the father, the boy, and the girl. So it's a classic kind of American family in a FEMA center. They all face different challenges, but one of the things that he might face is that conflict between getting back to work, being responsible, say he's a firefighter, or maybe, and she's a teacher, or maybe he works in a, in a chem lab and they need him back, or maybe he's a, an electrician and they desperately need him back to help get those wires up. At the same time, that his kids don't have a place to sleep at night and that he has to support her because she's taking care of grandmother. What Whatever it might be, that conflict between work and family, which is rife in our field, really is acute for men and is something we need to study a, a lot more. Um, and, and poverty, and particularly at the, at the lower levels of, of um, poverty, at the, at the fringes uh, of our societies, whatever society you might think of, right? It's an enormous challenge for, to keep families together. And families are often separated, men are separated, so they don't lack that kind of emotional support system and nutritional support system and everything else that often comes from family life are divorced from that, and it's, a, it's an extremely hazardous kind of situation. He's here. This picture for me again stands into the, the what happens to relationships are so problematic, I would say, at the best of times, <laughs> living with each other, I mean really. And in disasters, everything that's good about us comes together and stronger relationships tend to get stronger and the inverse. Everything that was really hard and was dividing you before 
and some new things as well. And that's where sometimes violence comes up as a new thing in the relationship. Very often it comes up because it was there before. It's always there. But putting aside violence for a moment, there may be a challenge to men to just be there for her in a way that he wasn't before. Right? Women looking to him, looking to grandfathers, looking to fathers, looking to grown sons for something, some way to help through, like speak to me, talk with me, be there for me, come to the shelter with me, we need help, what can we be doing? That dialogue, that conversation may be asking something quite new of him. I think that's, a, a, again, a challenge. And being, um, being self-sufficient. So he might be one of the um, families from Katrina who is evacuated very far away. His family is maybe in Texas still, and he's trying to put together a life again and buying, not buying, picking, picking through clothes to, to clothe himself uh, when before she might have been doing this. Child-headed households is one of the things that we see in international disasters quite often when the parents are swept to their deaths, as, as in the case of the tsunami. And so sometimes children, younger or older children, older children would step into the lurch, really. And especially in the tsunami, with such high levels of fatalities among girls and women, they were young boys who suddenly stepped into this role of running families. It's very, very uh, difficult. And it happens in the United States as well. Again, some responsibility, so the, the relationships in a family between brothers between siblings is also going to change. And again, that's another kind of challenge that we know way too, way too little about. But sometimes we do know what's going to happen. And in some cultures, again, at some periods of time in our um, life here on the planet, what's the most important for men after a disaster, after losing their partner, is quick, fast, find another wife. And it's easy to kind of make fun of it, but it's actually it's a life-saving um, act and demand for men in a way. You can imagine the results it has when he turns to young child brides, which is what happened after the tsunami, a phenomenon called tsunami brides. So older men, quick fast looking for whomever they could quick marry and had the most cultural power to claim as, as young brides, tend to be young, young girls whose lives are forever transformed by that. But there's, um, uh, and again, it's easy to dismiss that, but we have to understand what, what, within what context he's doing that. Uh, control, I'm, I'm moving toward the end of, of this section of the talk. Control is obviously a huge issue, this notion of being in control over nature. What more essential bedrock issue about masculinity is there? And what more uh, abject demonstration of man's incapacity to control nature than a hurricane, a tornado, a massive fire pipe cannot, cannot be avoided at all. Inability to control emotions. And I love this photo because a photographer wrote underneath here, he said, he cried and I was forced to turn the camera away. So why? Why is that? Why is it that we're able and willing and so, um, so self-promotional about women's tears who are allowed to stand in? Our sorrow is allowed to stand in for human grief and disasters, right? But he turns the camera away when the man loses, con loses control here. Um, being demeaned and humiliated, and I'm, I have no idea if that's true of this case of the American Red Cross, but it's uh, uh, that sense of lack of control of having to ask outsiders for help and men having to ask women for help, an institutional a bureaucracy, a government. For some people, that's extremely difficult. Um, losing control in the, in the sense of more aggression, that's one of the things that we do find often in disasters. In addition to family violence, there's also male-on-male -male violence that tends to increase, so just more fighting, more fussing, more hitting more yelling and more getting in trouble, more encounters than between men and generally male-dominated um, police officers, and women pushing back. Women in your face, not standing up. Again, maybe raising issues that have been there forever, or maybe raising issues that are new, or maybe telling him, as we found out in Miami, that when we got a little bit of money after the hurricane and a woman had enough money to get a bus ticket to get out of town and leave a violent relationship, she was gone in a flash, right? So pushback, there's an opportunity for things to really radically change. And that sense of control then is challenged in disasters, and we've, t we've talked quite a bit about how that can be, the, the, and is basically the, the bottom premise for, for increased violence. Closely related is authority, which is a legitimate power, right? So there's control and power, and then there's authority, which is legitimated by faith or by law or by policy, by tradition. So she may or may not accept the, uh, the, accept the authority of the National Guard when they came. Again, this is a picture from Katrina. And he may or may not have accepted the militarization of that city. So many men in uniforms with guns, as you may have seen, um, this is some time ago now, I know, but came into the city and there was um, extraordinary high level of violence, um, of state perpetrated violence, the, the government killing, the men killing other men. So she may or may not respect that. Um, there and these men clearly did not. So in a humanitarian peacekeeping um, situation, it's men again who have, who are put into this position of having their authority challenged, which again can be challenging to their well-being, or they're simply mocked. 
Do you remember the story about Michael Brown, who was um, the, the first um, appointee to manage the Katrina debacle? Right? And his profession before that, his qualifications were that he raised Arabian horses, right? And he was a political appointee. He was not a professional emergency manager. And he was mocked, so his authority was undermined in that way. Um, as was the, this person from TEPCO, the, the um, industry that, that owns the, and operates the nuclear power plants in Japan that were so severely damaged and uh, resigned in shame when he was found to have not done his job, basically, so publicly shamed in that sense. And finally, all of this really wraps into what's, uh, what we can think about as, as men's identity, which is, of course, very complex, but it's surely not being incompetent, right? So there's a really challenge to your sense of being in control, but also like getting through it, knowing what you're doing, having a plan, having a sense of, of what to do. Um, of being self-sufficient, so it robs men and women uh, alike, but perhaps more important to men, I, I, I don't know, but uh, perhaps more important to men to be self-sufficient in, in a way that they can't be, to be the kind of father that you want to be, really, to, it's hard enough, again, I would say at the best of times for us to, to parent in the way that we would want to and that we, that we cherish, and in disasters it's extraordinarily difficult, especially for men, or to be a life partner with somebody who's, who shared your life and suddenly you're not able to acknowledge that love that you have and that life that you've built together because you can't jeopardize that in a relief system that doesn't account for people of different sexualities, that wants only the male head of household, right, that insists on, on not protecting your privacy. And there's that notion, that sense of identity, again, of being the first and the helper, the gnosis, and very deeply rooted in our cultures of chivalry, right, and challenge as well, because you may not be able to help the person you love most in the world. And um, that's very hurtful. You may not be able to make sense of the world. The men have a sense of being on top of the world, of being somehow or other the interpreter of the cultural world to children, and often sometimes to women. But disasters transform that radically. So if you're no longer able to, to tell the story, to tell the cogent story of what's going on, where do you go? Who has what resources? What are we going to do next, dear? That's uh, an extreme challenge, and often leads to depression, which um, uh, is, is one of the most widely accounted um, differences between women and men, more likely to be acknowledged by women than men, but more likely to lead to self-harm among men. So we have really got to take that on board and look. And challenge perhaps to the sense of identity, just fundamentally the identity of being of place, that men have a sense, as do women, both of us, all of us, of a place in a community. And I, lo I love that picture. It comes from Canada again. So what's the challenge to them is not just the farm, not just the livelihood, not just that his neighbor may have committed suicide, but having a sense that there's a future for him as a man and a grandfather and a son in a, in a traditional community that he values. So how am I doing on time? Because I need to... Not well. Not well? OK. How, how not well? <laughs> but it's wonderful. No, oh, keep on, but just, we need some questions. Okay, okay. Well, let me move a, a little quickly toward this. Um, so implications for change. I, um, again, I, I want to thank you for bringing me, but um, let's be clear, the woman who should have been here, unfortunately, was caught up in a really terrible bike accident. And I say should have because this is Shelley Patchlock, a young sociologist at the University of British Columbia, who's just completed a really great study that compares different groups of um, men fighting fires in this big Okanagan fire, basically. And perhaps it's a theme here that some of you as researchers or um, policymakers would want to explore a little bit more. She's not able to be here, so I thought I'd throw in a few slides anyway that, that express some of her work um, for, for you. And I just love this first sentence, which I will read aloud. In the case of the Mountain Park Fire, firefighters worked to protect patriarchy, natural resources, and homes, but were most successful in protecting patriarchy. Write that down, because that's, you will hear that sentence over and over and over again. Well, what does that mean? Just, just to give you a sense of what her argument was. It was a massive fire. It was quick. It was fast. Um, it was fought both by wild land, wild land, you know, um, firefighters, the crew, the wild, what do you call them here? I'm not quite sure what you would call them here. But structural firefighters are, do high, high uh, houses. And say again? And the bushfire crews would be us. So we have the different firefighters coming from radically different traditions and all put upon to explain why they lost, why they failed. They took this on so hard when they lost so many houses. Not too many um, people lost their lives, so quite different, of course, from your experience, right? But still, a sense of great loss. So it was incumbent upon them, she found, in her conversations with, um, I think, 120 men, um, to explain why. And one of the things that they fell back on was that it was his fault. 
And the structural wildfires, uh, fire, and structural house fires were basically impugning the masculinity of the crews, the wildland, the bushfire crews, right? Conversely, the, wash, the bushfire crews were really uh, highly critical of the structural firefighters, the house firefighters. And there was a lot of back and forth thing, a lot of really um, obnoxious jokes, which I won't share with you, but there, there was really just a sense of hostility that grew over time and, and became divisive in the field. So that was one of the ways that they, they tended to cope with that. So instead of coming together around that, they again created these tensions and conflicts because they felt, because of that close link between successful firefighters and successful masculinity, they felt unmasked and unmanned in a way. And there was a lot of other, there were a lot of other factors going on. The media, for example, played it up hugely. And it was a whole lot easier to go do an interview with the firefighter, the, the structural firefighters, because they lived in town, than it was to go talk with the firefighters who were actually out in the bush fighting the fire. So there was that kind of, oh, I'm sorry, that kind of imbalance in terms of the visibility of the labor there. Um, but there were material resources too. In the end of the day, the people who got pay raises were the structural uh, firefighters and not the people who lost their uh, lives out. Uh, they didn't lose their lives, but they, they, they gave a more physical response, shall we say, in the, in the bush. So a lot of lingering hostility there. And she's trying to tease apart what that means. And one of the things she looked at then was, well, how does that affect or does it, how does that relate to, to fire crews that have been integrated? And you have women coming onto the crews because as here, I'm sure you have women on your fire, fire crews as well in small numbers, I think. And that was true in Canada, it's true in the United States as well. And interestingly, she was looking at that. She found that there was some bonding of these two groups of men who, again, are just arguing each other and bad-mouthing it to the press and putting each other down, and he's a weenie and she's a whatever. But when women came on the scene, they all found themselves in support of that and were able to articulate a sense of themselves as being modern men, egalitarian men, pro-feminist men, in support of the women, and a different kind of a firefighter, not depending so much on brawn, uh, or even on big heavy machines as on being smart, being strategic, being prepared, being flexible, those kinds of things. So in that sense, she leaves us with a sense that there may be a new future there, um, that, that the entry of women into traditionally male jobs such as firefighting can help spark, although in balance her, her book is quite depressing because of this conflict that she sees between these two groups of men, which is, again, undermine their solidarity and, and they took it on and it hurt, it was hurtful to men who felt personally responsible for, for losing. Well, more positively, and I'll just run through these uh, slides very quickly, I think that there are um, real signs of change, both in uh, academia, in terms of masculinity studies and sex and sexuality. Definitely, when we look at development work, there's a lot more at attention to men and masculinities in development, so we need to build on that. Um, I won't talk much about those. That um, disasters uh, do create opportunities for fundamental structural transformational change, including in gender relations, if we will grab them, if we understand them, if we want them, if we want to make those kinds of changes, they're potentially possible. So let me end with just a, a few examples of good practice, uh, or I would say promising practice, just to give us a sense of what's happening on the ground here. This is a lovely little uh, flyer that comes from, from Florida, and I, I appreciate it because it features uh, a man here, and it's about being prepared before the next hurricane in Florida for increases in domestic violence. What a novel idea. Let's, we know this. We have 20 years of research. Let's be prepared for it. Let's make sure there's funding there, that the staff is supported, that there's a public education campaign around that. So that's a, a good thing, and it's led by men. Um, this notion that men are more, I think, engaged in that physical, that reaching out, that one-on-one -on -one support between men. I think we see many indicators of that. This is just one from a fire in Texas. Um, a new colleague of mine is, um, I guess his name is not, not here, Joe Smanlin, runs the Disaster Distress Helpline. And because he brought with him to this work, it's a new mental health helpline in the States, he had a long tradition of working in the anti-violence movement himself. So he was interested in domestic violence and disaster. He organized this Twitter chat. Was that what they're called? Twitter? So I'm, not, I'm so not into Twitter. <laughs> but it, it was a, an innovative kind of idea. And the uh, National Coalition Against Domestic Violence worked with this mental health line around using the new technology to talk about domestic violence. This is a campaign that comes from Nicaragua, where in the process of recovering from Hurricane Mitch, the organizers of this NGO uh, built into their recovery modules um, work around violence and how men, this says, disaster against women is one disaster, violence against women is one disaster that men can prevent.
Hmm? So again, a very progressive kind of notion. Um, in the States, I'm quite intrigued by, by this. Is, these are um, a military, these are our vets, the Team Rubicon, who have uh, really stepped forward to try and use the skills and aptitudes and experiences that they bring with them from battle of some one kind or another into disaster work. Not through the National Guard, not through military institutions, but as volunteers, right? So this is, I, I think, a positive step forward for many reasons. A lot of faith-based um, men's groups. If you look at gender-specific responses that are not government, but that are um, uh, communities-based, a lot of them tend to be based in faith. You're looking at uh, auxiliaries of groups. So I, I think that's something that we need to know a little bit more about, and it's definitely the Baptists have led, led the way. These are young gay um, children or youth in, in the Philippines who are taking part in, in an explicitly inclusive sexuality sensitive kind of disaster training program. We should do the same. These men are learning about disaster agenda in a, in a program from India and exploring the contents of women's pocketbooks in this picture. I only wish that we did the same more often. I think it would bring us together in unanticipated ways. And now how can I not have a picture of men's sheds? I don't know the context for this photo. Maybe some of you can help me know about it. But I'm so enamored of the notion of men's sheds. And I, I know that they don't that, that they're, they work for some more than others and perhaps are too freighted in some way. But um, I love it. I love the idea. And so I put that forward as a best practice, which I talk up wherever I go. This is a, um, a final slide, really, of showing an example of communities. These are indigenous communities from um, northern Alaska after the Exxon Valdez spill who came down to help the indigenous communities that were affected by the BP spill and by the hurricanes there, coming together to try and share indigenous knowledge and to support one another. And they did it by recreating um, by, sorry, drums and had a, a drum making ceremony so that the children would learn again what that was like. And it brought women together again, women and men together. It was strongly led by women, funded by women's organizations, but they wouldn't have dreamed of having it without men. And the men wouldn't have dreamed of coming if they alone, basically. So it's a good model, I think, for us that when we put our hearts to it, we can do excellent work. When we work together, we do better work. And here we are together. I end this with the, the, um, the firm belief that we are starting something absolutely new and critically important to building a safer, more resilient, more just, more livable, more men-friendly, more women-friendly kind of a world. And if we don't, um, shame on us because we have the opportunity to do so. We have the resource to do so. So again, thank you for your attention. And I'm really, I want to just repeat again, I'm here to listen and to learn as much as anything else, but I hope that this has helped kind of um, put the work that you do today in a little bit of a context. So with that, I'll stop. Thank <laughs> you.